So let's get into it. And I'm going to start with this conference realignment talk. Um, and I don't want to get specifically into exactly what's going on with the ACC, because to be quite honest with you, they have a grant of rights in the ACC, and it's really long. Okay, so it goes into the mid-2030s, 2035, I believe. And, you know, there's this report about, oh, they're going to form a power block and force their way out, blah, 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 blah. I believe that this brings up a bigger subject and, and a more important subject um, when it comes to, to our sport. And, and that's this. The instability in college football surrounding conferences is not stopping. Okay? So as much as people want to say that, okay, let's just get through this round of realignment. Let's get Oklahoma and Texas to the SEC, and let's get USC and UCLA to the Big Ten. And then, like everyone, we can just take a deep breath, and everything will be better. Everything will be better. And the Big 12 will have their new conference, and then we'll see what happens in the Pac-12 slash 10, whatever they want to call themselves, and everything will be better. And then the ACC's grant of rights deal doesn't last until the mid, you know, or does last until, you know, 2035, and everything will be fine. But that's a lie. That's a lie. This is never going to stop. It's never going to stop. And I want to talk about the reasons why. Um, and I know that some of them are obvious, but I want to be more specific uh, with you and kind of let you peek under the hood a little bit about what goes on in college football and, and what's wrong with the business model. Because I do think that the overall structure and overall business model in college football is somewhat broken. And we'll go over that here uh, as we start. So, this is not going to stop. That's the first truth. And and you have to understand that it's not going to stop because there's not an unlimited source of money. These networks that basically fund all of sports, but certainly college football, there's not a blank check. And I think the Pac-12 is realizing right now, and maybe even some other people, even the NFL to a certain de degree, there was this sense a few years ago that like, hey, the streamers are going to come in and just save us and like bump us up exponentially as far as value and, and revenue. But that's not the case. It's not the case because their business model is changing. And it's changing faster, by the way, than the linear business model has, has ever changed. So let's, let's take a snapshot right now. Like, let's actually talk about what's going on. Why is this not going to stop? Well, first, number one is there's not an unlimited source of money. So because of that, the money has to get smarter, okay? So when, when 10 years ago, when a lot of these deals were signed, right? When the Big 12 signed their deal and the Pac-12 signed their deal, Colorado moved and Nebraska moved and Maryland and Rutgers moved. And like our last iteration of conference realignment was really born out of volume. And conferences needed more teams. They needed more markets. And that's because the... The, the business model was born out of linear television and more specifically cable television. And cable television was about subscriber fees. And so you just needed bigger, better, more. And you needed those markets to get more subscriber fees in order to drive your value up. It wasn't necessarily about the quality as it was about the quantity. Well, that's totally changed now. Just in, in a short decade now, what's going on is that it's not about quantity and it's all about quality because the haves are really separating themselves out as far as the number of eyeballs you have. So as a conference, no one cares anymore how many subscribers you have. They care how many eyeballs you have. And those are two different things, very different things. Okay. It's not about the bundle anymore. It's about who can you get to your game and how long can you keep them there? And, and when you look at it through that lens, you start to see exactly why this disparity in terms of value is starting to approach in college football, where we've got the haves, Big Ten and the SEC, and the have-nots, everybody else. And, and here are the numbers to bear that out. I'm going to give you the most watched game featuring conference teams in every conference. Okay, so this is, this is apples to apples. It's conference matchups, and it's the biggest one of the year. The Big Ten, it's obvious. It's Michigan and Ohio State. It's the top-rated game in all of college football. 17.14 million people watched that. 17.14 million viewers. That's enormous. That's enormous. The SEC, 
no big surprise, they were next. Tennessee at Georgia, 13.06 million viewers. That's enormous. That's a, that's a great number. And then you start getting into the other three conferences, and it takes a massive dip. Massive dip to the tune of 8 million viewers. Okay, so the Big 12, their most watched conference game was TCU at Texas, 5.03 million viewers. The ACC's most watched game was North Carolina State at Clemson. That was 4.98 million viewers. And the Pac-12's most watched game in conference was USC and UCLA, 4.53 million viewers. It's not even in the same hemisphere. And so when you see that the money has to get smarter and they're not chasing subscribers, but they're chasing eyeballs, then clearly you're going to see where the money is going and the money is going to the SEC and the Big Ten. I know everyone kind of knew that already, but that puts it in, in a better context for you. Okay, Think of it as quality and, and quantity. And right now we are in an era where quality matters. These dollars chasing these conferences, by the way, they're going to continue for the SEC and the Big Ten. Those deals are very big, and as long as those numbers stay where they are, those numbers will continue to, to be big and maybe even get bigger, which brings up the next truth. You know what's next for us in college football? I told you this is never going to stop, right? I wasn't lying. This is never going to stop because as it's been, it's been about who can we add to increase value so that we all make more money. Well, pretty soon, it's going to start being about who can we drop. I know people think I'm crazy and look at me kind of sideways. That's absolutely coming. Because, again, there's not an unlimited source of money, and the money then has to get smarter. And and I know I said, a lot of college football fans don't like this conversation because I've said the word money too much. But the bottom line is, is like that's relevant in this model. And, and I'm going to get to a place where I think that there are some fixes that will make the sport better. But for right now, you have to understand that there are what is going to be entering into college football is really poor economies of scale. Think about it now. You've got all these members. Only a few of them are actually driving the overarching value, almost like taxpayers, right? You know, only a certain number of taxpayers actually pay all the taxes. Well, only a certain number of teams in every one of these conferences are actually driving the valuation for the entire conference. Well, pretty soon, those teams are going to be like, hey, we can't handle the dead weight. And at, th at this point, having X, Y, or Z school in our conference is just diluting the conference. It's diluting it in two ways. One, we've got to chop up the pie in a, a more pieces. And then the other is we've got to enter them into the schedule. So we don't even get all the big boys facing each other as often as they should because we've got to dilute the schedule with that other team that really doesn't derive any value. So at some point in the next 10 years, you're going to hear a conversation about like, hey, is this a good fit for this school or this program within the, this conference? That feels like Game of Thrones, but you think we're not in Game of Thrones? College football is Game of Thrones. Look at it. Because of USC and UCLA's move, and they had no other choice. They had no other choice because they have to get in line with the smart money that I was talking about a little bit before. So it, it, it begs the question, like, what do we do? If you're telling me it's all doom and gloom, all this stuff, what do we do? Well, you know what? There are some things that we can do. And... This is another, you know, I get crossway looks, if that's how you even say it, cross-eyed looks from people in college football when I bring this up. But there's a reason that this isn't a problem in the NFL. And the reason that this is not a problem in the NFL is because everybody is rowing in the same direction. Everyone's pulling in the same direction in the NFL. Broadcast partners, um, programs, divisions, the, the, the NFL, everybody. Everybody involved is pulling in the same direction, where in college football, that's not the case. Everybody is competing. Everybody is in a silo, whether it's broadcast partners or conferences or programs, and everybody's just watching out for themselves. So let's make an analogy. If the NFL is like watching an Olympic crew race, rowing, where they're all going in the same direction Everybody is in a, a skull. Is that what they call it? I don't even know. And they're rowing in this a skeleton. Is that what they, and they're rowing in the same direction. It's all like really uniform. And it's like, wow, look how fast they're going. They're all going really fast. It's really good. 
if that's the NFL, you know what college football is? It's like go out on a Saturday in, in New York and like go look at the the Hudson or something. Like go to try to look at the Statue of Liberty and there's just boats going every different direction. It's a madhouse. That's college football. NFL, everyone's pulling in the same direction. College football, everyone's pulling in a different direction. So what do we need to do? Well, we've got to start creating systems that allow us to pull in the same direction. I believe that one of the ways that we do that is we create a centralized body for college football. I've been on this for a long time. You've heard me talk about this on this podcast for a long time. Let's just put it to you this way. If the NFC East could do their own television deal, do you think it would be bigger than the AFC South? Absolutely. And it would be substantially bigger. And every team in the AFC South would be clamoring if they could get any value, if they could get any leverage. They would be like, please, NFC East, take us. Take us. That's what we're at in college football. But you don't have that in the NFL. Why? Because everybody's pulling in the same direction. And they're pulling in the same direction because there is a centralized body over that sport. And that centralized body, whether it's governance or any other type of of, um, issue, is looking out for the best interest of the whole. And that's what we need in college football. I think that we are in desperate need of that. And by the way, I'm not talking about a centralized governing body for like athletics at a certain level. I said football. I think part of the reason that we're in this situation is that the most powerful people or influential people in our sport are generally commissioners. And those commissioners are responsible for their entire conference, including non-revenue sports. That's madness. That's madness. We've got to stop with this whole like notion that we're going to govern and put under the same umbrella the 16 to 20 non-revenue sports per school just like we're going to govern and, and put under an umbrella college football. It is so different now. It's so This is not 1952. So we need to get with the times, right? It's 2023. We see what's going on. There's clearly a problem. Everyone's pulling in a different direction. We need a centralized body over college football, okay? Not the 16 to 20 non-revenue sports, but college football. And someone that's just looking out for our sport all the time, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. That's what we need. That body desperately needs two things, okay? So if you were to ask me, like, Joel, what what would that body need? What would it do? How would you fix it? Okay, you can't just say, like, hey, look, you know, we got a commissioner or we got a, a, a body or whatever it is, a, a board of directors, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it. Board of regents, if you want to, although that kind of made me throw up in my mouth a little bit. Um, that body would need two things, only two. They would need leverage over legacy and purse. Legacy and purse. Once you started getting leverage or power over legacy and purse, then you can start to effectuate change. Because if you don't have power over those things, then what's the motivation for any schools to fall under your jurisdiction? Well, there's not. There's not. So you need power over legacy. And when I say legacy, I obviously mean championships. You don't develop a legacy without championships. So you need power over the legacy or the championship, and you need power over the purse. Well, the purse is really hard because it's like you need inventory to have control over the purse or revenue. So it's my belief, and I've said this for a long time, and I've given this idea on this show for a long time. I believe that that body already exists. The body is the college football playoff. However you want to do it, whoever you want to put on that board, the playoff is the body that is the pathway forward for college football, not only for the postseason, but also for the overarching fix for a lot of the problems that we have right now, because that's the only body that has power or leverage over those two things, legacy and purse. And by the way, I think that they need to increase their leverage over purse or inventory or revenue, whatever you want to call it, by clawing back non-league revenue, non-league games, non-league inventory. If we were to give the college football playoff the ability to go sell and have rights over every non-league game in college football and every postseason game, any non-league game, the playoff has it, guess what? They could go sell that, have power over that, draw more value 
create more value, even hold that leverage over potential broadcast partners. And as you distribute that revenue, you can distribute it a lot more evenly throughout college football than what is being done currently. And when you distribute that revenue more evenly than what it's happening right now, guess what you get? More stability. That's what you get. You get more stability. So it's a long road to say, there's an inherent issue that's going to continue unless we do something drastic. If we do something drastic, I think that it's got to be all the way. And we got to really dive in. And guess what? Guess what? It's not just about solving conference realignment or the instability surrounding conference realignment. A, a, a centralized body for football would help with that issue, it would help with NIL guidelines. It would help with portal structure. It would help with the calendar in college football, postseason structure. It would help with governance. It would help with rules and officiating. Think about all the things that we need a centralized body over, and this is just one of them. You see, every one of these problems is more of a symptom than they are an actual uh, cause. And because of that, I think that we need something that can look after and and in all reality, fix a lot of the issues. I think that if you do that and you put an umbrella over the sport via a centralized body, you can fix a lot of different things. I know that was a long dissertation and you might've gotten lost a little bit in there. I think I might've lost myself a couple of times, but you kind of get the idea. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoy that clip, make sure you click subscribe somewhere down here. From game highlights to exclusive interviews and rankings, we've got everything you need as a college football fan right here, College Football on Fox.